It's Pride Month and Nevada is getting national attention for its newest LGBTQ laws. We examine those plus. The sights and sounds of a Stanley Cup parade. A look at how the Vegas Golden Knights celebrated their championship win. That's this week on Nevada Week. Support for Nevada Week is provided by Senator William H. Hernstadt. Welcome to Nevada Week. I'm Amber Renee Dixon. June is Pride Month and with Republican Governor Joe Lombardo signing two gender affirming bills, Nevada's gay friendly reputation is reaching new heights. But just how gay friendly is Nevada really? Some Local advocates will tell you work remains. Among them are Andre Waite, State Director for Silver State Equality, Carl Catarata, Nevada State Director for the Human Rights Campaign, and A.J. Huth, Director of Public Affairs and Civic Engagement at the Center. Thank you all for joining us. Let's start with the work that has been done. SB 163 has been signed into law and it requires health insurance companies, including Medicaid, to cover gender affirming care for transgender minors minors and adults. How big of a deal is this, Andre? It's a really big deal. It's something that uh, Senator uh, Melanie Scheibel had been working on for a couple of years. The bill didn't pass in the last session, so we're really excited that we got the bill passed this time around. And the bill really requires that insurance companies to not discriminate for insurance coverage for transgender folks. AJ, how big of a problem was this? I had a friend of mine actually that um, went to get gender affirming care and they had to pay out of pocket because even though the, the care was covered on their insurance, um, the doctor didn't take that uh, because the insurance was not paying the claims fast enough. And so they are requiring some of our uh, you know, friends to pay out of pocket. Mm, okay, uh, gender affirming care, Carl, is is described or is defined by the human rights campaign as medically necessary for the well-being of many transgender and non-binary people who experience symptoms of gender dysphoria or distress that results from having one's gender identity not match their sex assigned at birth. For our viewers who may be wondering what is considered medically necessary. What kind of care, what kind of examples could you provide them? Absolutely. This specific care and the specific treatment is uh, supported by many of the major American medical um, associations and organizations out there. Doctors, uh, medical providers, making sure that we are expanding and supporting our trans and non-binary community uh, when it comes to the care and access needed uh, to live a full and equal life. And why are they supporting this? Yeah, I mean, this is it's the right thing to do, right? It's the right thing to do when it comes to making sure that people in America um, are able to live their full um, life, right? Uh, you know, you want to make sure that uh, the way that you want to live your genuine life, uh, you're able to get that access. Specifically here in Nevada, uh, we've been able to have the opportunity uh, to be able to create uh, these services and expand uh, our civil liberties to protect our uh, trans and non-binary community. Um, but it's unfortunate that other states don't see the same way. And when you talk about medical organizations supporting this care, a lot of it has to do with mental health, correct? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. A part of gender affirming care is uh, mental health services. It's also uh, social aff affirmation, especially for young people. So when we talk about gender affirming care, people always go to surgeries and operations, which is not always the case. Not every transgender person wants to have surgical procedures and not every medical provider prescribes that. Could you give some more examples of what medically necessary care would look like, AJ? Yeah, so, you know, you mentioned the American Medical Association, also the American Psychological Association um, has proven over and over again um, that, you know, affirmation and supportive services are necessary for the mental well-being of people who are trans or even people that are gay and lesbian, bisexual as well. Um, and so, you know, mental health care is part of gender affirming care. Um, as Andre said, we, we can't go right to the medical piece. Sometimes it's just that affirmation. Um, you know, honoring somebody's pronouns can be, that's gender affirming care. 
Um, and it's these little things that are very important to affirm that you know our young people are who they say they are and that we trust them and we believe them and we support them. And I don't add, it's anywhere from facial feminization to uh, voice therapy. Um, and so it's a lot, it's a litany of um, procedures that again just aren't surgical in nature. Say those two again. You said vocal therapy, vocal therapy. and facial feminization. Okay. So often insurance companies see facial feminization as cosmetic, like people just want to look beautiful for the sake of looking beautiful. But if someone who's a trans woman can have their facial features feminized so they can be more in line with their gender and quote unquote pass in society and not be harmed because they look a certain way, then that's life saving. And so it's beyond just cosmetic surgery, it's about them being aligned with their gender. Mm -hmm. So yep. medically necessary, life-saving in that it's perhaps preventing suicide? Yes, and even unfortunately homicides, let's be honest. Mm -hmm. And also... How, how so homicides, yeah. Andre, sorry. There are hundreds of trans people, thousands sometimes mm -hmm. across the world that are being um, murdered simply because of who they are. And someone's passability can really impact their ability to navigate their lives with safety. Oh, mm -hmm. I see. Okay. Uh, and I wanted to expand. I mean, uh, my colleague Andre Wade from Silver State Equality um, and AJ from the center put it really best, right? Uh, we are trying to make sure that uh, once one wants to live uh, their full life, um, making sure that they have uh, the access and care that is medically necessary, but also uh, the social uh, impacts that can also um, help somebody um, live a more positive, open, um, and also uh, uh, a life that is of a good quality of life, right? So, for example, we're talking about uh, Senate Bill 163, where non-discrimination for the insurance coverages for gender-affirming care. Nevada, we're seeing that our lawmakers say that, yes, we, we understand and we agree that this is medically necessary, but also this is good when it comes to our community. But other states don't see the same. And uh, when we're talking about um, you know, pronouns and um, social impact, um, tolerance and equality are big things that, um, for the LGBTQ community, we want to make sure that we see happen. The surgery aspect, is that included in this, um, in this bill? Uh, gender confirming surgery, gender affirmation surgery, some people have called it gender reassignment surgery. Andre, is that included as medically necessary in this bill? It can be considered medically necessary if the doctor prescribes it. And you know, when it comes to young people, there were extra standards and steps um, that a physician and parents who are a part of the decision making for this for their minor child mm -hmm. would have to take in order for that to be uh, provided for them. And so without this law, these additional standards for young people would not have been in place. And so it's really a good thing that we already had gender affirming care allowable, like with Medicaid. Uh, but this bill makes it to where other insurance companies cannot discriminate simply because someone's transgender. And if we didn't put those additional steps in there for minors, we wouldn't have those additional protections. And so it's a really good thing that Melanie Scheibel, Senator Melanie Scheibel, added that. And Governor Sisolak, um, excuse me, Governor Lombardo recognizes that and was able to sign the bill into to law. Oh, well, I'm going to pick up on that. You said Governor Sisolak, who was the previous governor, a Democratic governor. Governor Joe Lombardo, new governor, Republican governor, yes. signed some gender-affirming bills. How surprised were you, AJ? Um, I'm very happy, and I think it just goes down to, um, I feel like he took the time to actually read the bills, look at the content of what was in them, and made the decision based on that. Um, I'm very grateful that, you know, he uh, um, has taken the measures on these issues that he has. When you say that he actually read the bill, of course, right? I mean, is it, does that not happen? Why have I heard that a well, couple times now? We hope so. So view, for viewers at home, sometimes um, uh, elected officials may read or may not read. Luckily, we have uh, great elected officials here in Nevada, lawmakers and policymakers who do actually read the bill. Uh, we have a great legis legislature that is a citizen-based le legislature where our legislators and lawmakers do read through the bills, meet with constituency groups, meet with interest groups like us here today, um, and actually work uh, with our groups to making sure that every 
sentence or every paragraph in the bill um, is reflected when it comes to the community. Unfortunately, some states aren't like that. So, yeah. uh, some states are not as fortunate as Nevada. And when it comes to this specific bill, uh, Governor Joe Lombardo's team, um, it looks like you know, we're very grateful and we're very, we commend the governor uh, when it comes to the work that he is doing to expanding um, care for um, tra our trans and non-binary community, specifically for our LGBTQ community, because other governors across the country unfortunately aren't doing that. Right. Does yeah. this mean that the human rights campaign will endorse Joe Lombardo if he should run for re-election. Does this constitute enough for that? Great question. Uh, you know, we'll definitely meet with the governor and look towards the next election, but we definitely supported um, Governor Sisolak and we support uh, pro-quality legislators who are interested in expanding LGBTQ equality, but we'll work with anybody. We are a nonpartisan organization. We work with Republicans and Democrats across the country from set, uh, local, state, and federal levels, and we want to make sure that we are expanding rights for LGBTQ people across the country, because it's the right thing to do. Do you want to add to that, Andre? Sure, same. We're a nonpartisan organization. We will look at the votes that any Republican has done on our bills, and if they have higher marks, then we consider an endorsement. <coughs> we would love to have um, all legislators be in the line with our issues simply for the policy and the impact of our community and not make things a culture war. So we are more than happy to endorse anyone who's a supporter regardless of their political affiliation. And AJ, that is what I've been hearing a lot in regards to SB 163. The governor did not make this about culture. He made this about policy. What does that mean to you? Well, and he made it about protecting Nevadans. And I think that that's the most important piece. There's been so many um, states around the country that I think are just um, putting out misinformation and they're just going to, even though they say that they're not, um, they're really targeting our community, especially our transgender kids. And to know that the governor that leads this state is not doing that um, and is actually taking a look at what uh, the people in our community need, I, I think is commendable. Let's move on to another piece of legislation that he signed, uh, the former Clark County Sheriff signing uh, SB 153, which puts into place protections for incarcerated transgender people. What kind of protections, Andre, and why was this needed? So there are standards of care that are needed for really a lot of people in, who are incarcerated, including women who need access to feminine hygiene products. And so when you have standards of care that align with people's gender identity, so they will uh, have tra staff will be trained on how to refer to someone who's transgender and their uh, gender pronouns, make sure they have access to uh, mental health services, gender affirming care, and the right housing. And that's important because there's often transgender people who are mistreated while incarcerated simply because they are transgender. We want to try to mitigate that. And so we are happy that the director of uh, Department of Corrections, Zorinda, is in agreement with these standards of care. They've been doing a really great job um, and they follow the PREA standards, Prison Rape Elimination Act, that has a lot of transgender provisions in there. And so making sure that these standards are in place regardless of who's the, the director at the time and who, regardless of any staff at the time is really important. So we're really glad that Zorinda and his team are doing the right thing and this law will just help uh, solidify things for the future. I think in general, uh, some people struggle to have any empathy for people who are incarcerated. So what would you say to people who are struggling particularly with this, who, who think that this is uh, giving preferential treatment? That has been some of the opposition uh, noted against this bill. Yeah, I mean, basic human rights extends to every single person, whether or not you, uh, you know, going to jail or going to prison is not, should not be a death sentence. So making sure that we have basic human decency and human rights within uh, Nevada prisons, specifically in a state like Nevada, we need to make sure that uh, we, are protecting, <laughs> we are protecting the care and the quality of care when it comes to um, human beings in our corrections. And uh, again, we commend Governor Lombardo for making this specific step. Um, and we're looking forward to continuing expanding uh, care for our LGBTQ community. 
Speaking of opposition, I got so excited in our previous conversation about the, what we were discussing that I forgot to bring up the opposition to SB 163, which is the health care coverage for uh, gender affirming care, uh, Medicaid included in that. Um, an opposition letter to it from the Nevada Republican Party was, quote, this bill allows children to obtain permanent surgical procedures paid for by our tax dollars and does not require any parental notification. Is that true? Let's go back to the conversation about reading the bill. Um, obviously, they did not read the bill. And even Governor Lombardo, when asked about him, him signing the bill, made a statement like, read the bill. That's not what it says. And so, again, there are additional steps that uh, minors would have to take with their parents, with parental consent and oversight, uh, to have access to uh, surgeries and operations for gender affirming care that a doctor would also have to prescribe. And so it's categorically false, that statement, and it's misleading, it's misinformation, and it's dangerous. Taxpayers, though, as Medicaid, or you wanted to add something, AJ? Well, I just, this whole uh, narrative that's being pushed out, I think that people get a really scary image and fear in their heads because they don't really know our community, and so your mind can make up some very disturbing images. And I think that people are thinking, well, you know, kids are going in and they're getting genital surgery, right? And that is very rare. Um, I, I mean, I don't know of any kids that have had genital surgery at all, but general, genital surgery in general is not like a huge push. Um, when we're talking about, you know, surgeries like that, it's mostly top surgeries. So breast augmentation, breast reduction. Um, and, and those are, you know, m the most common when it talks to surgery, but again, these are not things that are being performed on minors, you know, and the, and the parents are involved in these conversations. Um, I don't know of any young person that can just go to a doctor and be like, I want genital reconstruction surgery and that's going to happen. That is not happening. It's a ridiculous narrative that's out there. And um, I'm, I'm glad that you asked about it because we need to dispel some of these myths and fears. For adults, uh, you mentioned top surgery, maybe breast enhancement surgery. Should that be covered under Medicaid? You would argue yes. Absolutely. There, you know, there are specific um, municipalities and different corporations that also do um, cover this uh, for our straight um, colleagues, our straight allies. Uh, but when it comes to uh, this specific care, um, you know, when we're talking about reducing homicides, reducing suicides, reducing and making sure that uh, we are allowing the full well-being of our trans and non-binary col colleagues, we want to make sure that, um, you know, this is not something that, you know, you walk into um, your doctor's office and say, this is, this is, um, you know, I just I'm want to do, do I just today. want, I just want to do this. This takes over a course of months and years and actual talking to several uh, physicians, doctors, uh, mental health professionals to making these serious changes uh, to one's life. Um, so short answer, yes. Okay. Uh, the, uh, you want to add? Okay. The other argument is uh, from the Nevada Libertarian Party as well as the Nevada Republican Party that this is going to increase the cost of health care for everyone, the mandated coverage. Your response to that? Um, that's also not true. They're about, including uh, young people, there are about 8,100 uh, transgender people estimated to be in Nevada. Not even all of those folks will want gender affirming care and be, that's covered by insurance. And so the increase would be minuscule. And so people always talk about the increased insurance coverage, but we are paying for things that we may not otherwise want to with our insurance company, but we're still paying into the pool, and that's just how it works with our Byzantine um, healthcare system. AJ, why are you smiling? I, just the way you described that, like we, we could do better to have better uh, health care in this country. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> and, and we ask, we ask definitely our libertarian and our Republican colleagues, meet with us. Definitely okay. meet with us, come to the table, right? Come to the table and let's come to a conversation because I know that this past legislative session, uh, there were some frustrations. So we're happy to talk and we're happy to open up the discussion because this would actually be a good benefit to taxpayers and to the people of Nevada. Okay, a piece of legislation that Governor Lombardo vetoed was SB 302 that aimed to protect health care workers who do provide gender affirming care to minors. Uh, during the legislative session, a local mom testified in support of it. Let's hear from her and then we'll discuss it. Good morning. My name is Elizabeth Stearns. Excuse me. And I'm the mother of a transgender child. 
Our son found the words to tell us that he was transgender when he was 11. He is now 17 and is thriving thanks to love and support from his family and his necessary affirming care. Our family moved here from Texas in November of 2021. We left our family, our friends, and our home after Texas lawmakers tried to pass laws that would criminalize our support of our son. We nervously watched sessions like this, wondering if they would pass a bill that would prohibit his health care providers from continuing his care, would label us child abusers, remove our children from us, and put us in jail. There was very little relief when the bills ran out of time and didn't pass because we didn't think that would be the end of it. Our son's doctors felt the same as we received calls from some letting us know that even though the bills hadn't passed, and even though they knew how absolutely necessary his care was, they were now too scared to continue caring for minors. How common is this story, AJ, of people actually moving to Nevada because of the laws here or the laws that are in their state? We've gotten a lot of calls at the center for people wanting to move to Nevada um, and in Las Vegas. That's where we receive the calls, but um, also in contact with the center, our center up in Reno. Um, they're actually getting more calls up there than we are here in Las Vegas. And so it's a, it's a very real uh, problem that's happening. Okay, Andre, the governor in his veto message said that this inhibits the executive branch's ability to be certain that all gender affirming care related to minors comports with state law. It also decreases the executive branch's authority to ensure the highest public health and child safety standards for Nevadans. How do you interpret that? Um, we don't agree. And with the signing of 160, SB 163, these higher standards are in place. And so it doesn't completely make sense because it's the same coverage and care that's being provided with standards. And if they don't have oversight because of SB 302, that means they're not going to have oversight with SB 163. So it just doesn't make sense from a policy perspective. But And they are cons continuing to just focus on minors, which there are many states that are trying to uh, ban gender affirming care for adults. Mm -hmm. So the uh, SHIELD law would also impact uh, providers of gender affirming care for adults. And so it's unfortunate that the governor and his team uh, landed that way. But if we have to go back to the drawing board for the next session, we will. And that's how it works because a vetoed bill gets to go to the next session automatically. We're running out of time. I mentioned in the intro how Gay friendly is Nevada, really. Uh, let's start with you, Carl, because nationally, the human rights campaign issued an alert for the mm -hmm. safety of LGBTQ plus Americans. Also, uh, the Department of Homeland Security said threats of violence against the community are up. So what is going on here in Nevada? Is there violence? Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, there are 75 anti LGBTQ bills that have been passed um, and passed and introduced across the country. We want to make sure that uh, here in Nevada, we are welcoming our, our LGBTQ residents, tourists, and anyone who wants to come to Nevada. Nevada is a place where LGBTQ people can feel safe. Of course, we need to do more work. And of course, when it comes to our state of emergency that the Human Rights Campaign has issued, the first uh, travel advisory in 40 years of our organization and our existence, uh, we really do ask Americans to really take seriously and if they identify as LGBTQ, when they go to specific states, know your laws before you go. Know uh, your different um, safety uh, before you visit that state. Uh, but Nevada continues to lead the way, and we're very proud of our lawmakers, and we're looking forward to continuing expanding. And Andre, we've got like 20 seconds left. What are the laws that make Nevada special? So USA, Day, USA Today 2021 said Nevada is the best state for LGBTQ plus Americans to live because if we look at the HRC uh, index around legislation or the Movement Advancement Project, we as Nevadans have um, passed the most innovative laws um, in the nation. And so there's probably about two or maybe three or four that are listed on these indexes that we have not yet passed, whereas there are many states that have only uh, passed a few protections for LGBTQ plus people. So 
the protections that we have are vast and we have a lot more work to do. Including though the Equal Rights Amendment that was voted on this past uh, election cycle, correct? Yes, the most inclusive Equal Rights Amendment in the nation. Uh -huh. Thank you all so much for your time. It is time now to celebrate the Vegas Golden Knights, who after dominating the Florida Panthers in the Stanley Cup final, lugged Lord Stanley's Cup down Las Vegas Boulevard and into Toshiba Plaza for all their faithful fans to see. Nevada Week videographers Nikki Butts and Max Fox were there and captured the sights and sounds of Vegas's first ever Stanley Cup championship parade. Congrats to the Vegas Golden Knights and thank you for watching. I'll see you next week on Nevada Week.